Stay tuned for a special edition of the Multifamily Deal Lab podcast. My biggest fear was you can be very educated and have good track record, but I'm very selective and protective of my investors. You know, these are my closest mm-hmm. friends, right? So like I said, that's why I took my top two biggest fears. It's one thing I'm losing my own money, but losing my friend's money is not okay. Welcome to the Multifamily Deal Lab Podcast, where we dissect the deal before your eyes and ears so you can discover the strategies and tactics that got each deal to the finish line. Strategies and tactics that you can put in your own toolbox to get you to the closing table. From sourcing the deal, raising, due diligence to the property takeover, Multifamily Deal Lab shows how you too can get the deal done. And now here's your host, David Lindahl. Everybody, welcome to Multifamily Deal Lab. I'm your host, Dave Lindahl. This week, I'm with Jason Graves, and we're going to be talking about how he raised $600,000 to buy a mobile home park, how he purchased it for $1.5, and within seven months later, it was worth $2.7 million. Um, his investors got back 110% of their capital within 12 months. And he says he's got mailbox money for life, which is a sweet thing. But before we get into that, Let's do a little bit of mindset minute. Let's talk about why this is your time. Okay. Right now, the markets are good. The opportunity is here. The education is available. The community, the RE Metro community is here to support you. So how do you take advantage of this time? How do you take advantage of post pandemic, you know, where the opportunity is going to be as great, if not greater than the 2008 financial crisis? Well, first of all, all right, we're going to give you all the tools. Of course, we'll give you all the knowledge that you need. We'll give you all the skill set. But before you can even go forward, you have to get your head straight. All right? So you know you're going to be able to do it. You know you have it inside of you. You have greatness inside of you, just like we all have greatness inside of us. But how do we tap into it? All right? So today's Mindset Minute is all about hacking into your brain to change it. So you've got to change something and do something differently in order to get different results. Now, here's something that I do on a regular basis, and that is while I sleep, I have affirmations playing in the background, all right? Now, it's not, I've tried, there's two different types. One affirmation start out, you start listening to them as you're going to sleep, and then they actually go way into the background of nice music that plays, so you don't even hear the affirmations. There's another set that will play all night that would just be affirmations. I've done that, but... That I ended up waking up in the middle of the night with somebody talking and I would always wake up and then I can't get back to sleep. So um, there's a couple, I'm going to give you a couple of resources right now. One of them is called sleep and grow rich, sleep and grow rich. So if you go on YouTube and Google uh, YouTube sleep and grow rich, you'll see uh, there's one uh, uh, where it's affirmations while you sleep and 1.2 million people listen to this on a regular basis. And that one's really, really nice to listen to that one on a regular basis. Uh, There's another one. If you uh, can take people talking all night long, there's one called the law of attraction affirmations while you sleep. That's a good one too. I'll tell you what I do is I listen to the uh, sleep and grow rich or other, other ones. And then when I wake up, what I'll do is I'll put on the law of attractions, the affirmations um, that actually talk to you because that first 15 minutes when you wake up, when your mind is still in this Delta phase is really, really, really important. So that's what I do. That's a great thing to do. Now, a couple other things. So if you want to feel up, if you want to wake up feeling great in the morning, not just for affirmations, but if you want to listen to music um, that will take out the negativity in your mind. It'll actually remove all the negativity from the different chakras inside of your body. This one's called binaural beats by B I N U R A L binaural beats. Okay. Stop negative thoughts, be positive. That's the one I listen to. And trust me, you have that playing in the background uh, all night. You know, it binaural beats goes right into the Delta of your mind. And, and if you don't wake up, feeling great in the morning, give me a call. I'll give you another one. But that one is just awesome. Um, So if you're the type that wakes up in the middle of the night or if these things wake up in the middle of the night and you can't go back to sleep, there's another great one to listen to that somebody here in the office, Chris, just gave to me. And it's by uh, Max Richter. It's R-I-C-H-T-E-R, Max Richter. And it's called Sleep. All right. And a composer and a neurologist got together and they created this music that goes directly, plays directly into your mindset, and it just puts you into a trance and you are out. 
you know, within, you know, four, five, six, seven minutes, you are out and uh, you have really, really nice. And if the, the, all these things that I'm uh, sharing with you, they all go for uh, anywhere from six to eight hours. So there you go. That was your mindset minute. Write those things down, use them, hack your brain because this is your time. Okay. And to get maximum results, you got to start doing some uh, things differently. So you get different results. All right. If you go to davetoday.com, I have got a free book offer for you. And it is my iconic multifamily millions book. I wrote this as a sequel to Emerging Real Estate Markets. But this has been the start of many, many of our students' multifamily millions. So many people were inspired by this particular book and continue to be inspired by because it's foundational information that gives you the awareness, the foresight to know that you can become a multimillionaire and the step-by-step on how to go do it. Now, this book retails on Amazon for $23. You can have it for free. All I ask is you pay shipping and handling of $7.95. And you can also get some free bonuses when you do and also autograph it for you. Those bonuses are number one, the 27 ways to buy multifamily properties with no money down. There's actually 104 ways in here. You hand it to your management company. They go out and do what it says. Uh, And then in doing that, you keep your property leased up and you keep that cash flow coming in. Another bonus I have is the deal flow playbook. This is a playbook of checklists for all the different things that you're going to be doing in your multifamily deals, step by step. You, I learned a long time ago that if you do not uh, follow a checklist and check things off, you miss things. And those are the things that are going to cost you money. So everything that you do in sourcing deals, underwriting deals, raising funds for your deals, taking over the properties on your deals, to the nitty gritty, the lease audit on your deals, to preparing for the exit of your deals. Everything has a checklist. You get all those checklists as a bonus, and that's free. And then I mentioned I wrote the book, Emerging Real Estate Markets. I also have a poster for you, and that is the Emerging Real Estate Markets poster. It gives you the four stages of the emerging markets. It gives you each particular phase, the key characteristics of those phase, and down below, it tells you what your key strategies should be for that particular phase. So you can just simply put this on your wall. And with that, you can determine what your market is, where it is in any particular phase, or If you're looking for emerging markets, which markets around the United States are actually emerging? And then from there, you can make the most amount of money in the least amount of time with the least amount of risk. And as you know, investing in multifamily properties and becoming wealthy, that wealth is created through appreciation. So that's why we are giving you the emerging uh, market cycles as well. So multifamily millions, all the bonuses, just pay shipping and handling, and you get it now. So let's go on to Jason Graves. Jason Graves, tell everybody who you are, where you're from. Jason Graves uh, from sunny San Diego. Been here for almost 30 years. So it's not a better place in the country to live. I, I think weather's good and it's a great place. So yeah, I'll raised, agree with that. Raised my two girls and been married for 25 years. So Wow, that's awesome. Where did you move from? Los Gatos. It's the Silicon Valley, uh, outskirts of the Silicon Valley. I don't know over, yep. if you know that is. Down. Yep. Yep, I do. I don't know exactly what that is, but I know Silicon Silicon Valley is. All right, so let's talk about your mobile home park. First of all, tell everybody what you bought, what size it was, how much you paid for it, how much the raise was. Right, so the deal that we had was, the raise was $600,000. So it was right about a million five was asking. They asked a million seven, we bought it for a million five. And How'd you get uh, it down 200,000? What did you do to negotiate it down 200? It was really a relationship. It was a very small town in Brookings, South Dakota. Uh, the the sellers knew that my partners had three or four parks. It was a long trusted relationship uh, that that helped. Um, they also had they knew that we could close right, so there was confidence there um, that we'd done this before. And what's interesting is that had you bought a mobile home park before? I hadn't. So you know when we met a couple of years ago, I was going multifamily and I hit the ground running. And my first year, we, I bought about ninety six units out in Kansas City, Missouri. But when the pandemic hit, I pivoted radically because you know I was worried that my renters were just going to stop paying my mortgage. Mm-hmm. To be frank. Mm-hmm. 
So I, re- I reached out to Rudy Cutler, and he was on uh, Brandon Turner's um, Bigger Pockets show as a subject matter expert on the mobile home space. And I actually was just, I just wrote a check. I was just a limited partner um, or considering writing a check. And the interesting part of the story is this was, this was actually Rudy's and team's first syndication. So they hadn't raised money before. They didn't really know, you know, what they didn't know. And I had just gone through this for the last 18 months. I had seven syndications in my belt. You know, I knew how to set the LLC. I knew how to raise money. I knew the legal side of it. So I felt real comfortable with that. And the funny part, because when I was talking to Rudy, basic questions like how much, how much is this going to cost in legal? And he throws out a number and it's like, you know, one third or, you know, one half of what actually I thought was going to cast. And then, you know, two weeks after his money, money had gone hard. He was, trying to get the last 300K and he hadn't raised it yet. So he was going to lose the deal. And I asked for two or three days. And fortunately, um, I called just two or three of my key investors that already invested with me on a bunch of my buildings and trusted me. And I literally had the $300,000 in 90 minutes. So wow. that, that, that enabled us. And I was just really, I mean, I have you know, 15, 20 investors at the time, but I took my top two with my own money to trust these guys, right? Because I wanted to test them to see how that, you know, it looks good on paper. I like the industry. It was my first asset class. But um, what was crazy about the park is, you know, we closed, we went through and it was a, it's in Brookings, South Dakota, really small town, but there was good diverse job growth jobs, right? It's not tied to the oil. And it was a 40 pad park, but what got exciting is there was room for 80, right? And then there was really bad deferred maintenance um, that mom and pop had not put any money into these parks for for years. So the first part was just literally just landscaping, new signage, cleaning it up, taking five homes off to the dump. And then there's a laundromat that was kicking off. Just really like hooking them up to a truck and driving them to a dump. Exactly. And leaving them there. Yep. Yep. And I was talking to Rudy. I mean, what I didn't know is like the the, pro, the main problem with it, with this park in this town was a bad reputation. Like it was the it was not a good park. It was kind of um, I don't you know just not to say shady, shady, but it was just it was definitely a C park with a lot of vacancy. There was like twenty one empty units. So there was a laundry mat there as well that was kicking off like seventy thousand in cash. But we're all software guys. I, I worked for Adobe for eighteen years, and Reed has a high tech background or a, a, a corporate background. So we, the first thing, you know, after we got the park and we closed, we went into the laundry mat, made it all credit card um, accepting yeah. credit cards, and there's mobile apps now, which you know people can just do off their cell phone, and it sends them a text like a when they're well. No, it's even better because it sends them a text when their laundry's done. So they can they can oh, pay wow. off of their cell phone like Venmo, yeah. but then they, you know notifies them and they just come out and um, so that's that's good. And then we cleaned it up. And then again, I'm just kind of testing these guys, seeing how they're communicating. And then literally, you know, it was paying a 10% preferred return as investor, right? So you know, I wrote write a check for 100 grand. I'm going to get if we hit the numbers. I'm going to get ten thousand dollars. That's what I'm expecting. Seven months yeah. later, they had enough value add from just what I just described to go back to the bank and it got reappraised for 2.7 million enough money to give all the limited partners back hundred percent of our, our money that we put in. So in my pocket, I have 110 K right. And then it goes to a 50, 50 split for us. So I have an ATM for the rest of my life kicking off, you know, 20, 30 grand a year plus. That's pretty sweet. All right. So first of all, you started investing. It's not unusual by the way, for people to, uh, going to multifamily and also cross right over to mobile homes as well because the um, the analytics are very similar. Um, the one thing is um, you want to make sure that they can't drive away with the home, right? Is that what t- type of park you got there, which all right. where, where the trailers are attached? Yeah, so so they they can't so they and the whole business model is to sell off the the park owned homes to the tenants. So we want them to own the home, and then we increase mm-hmm. the lot rent. When we bought the park, it was about 200 from day one. Once we owned it, we increased that to 250 per month, right? But these are like $20,000, $25,000 homes, right? They're very inexpensive homes in South Dakota. So if they did get behind two, three months, they do have the opportunity yeah. to take that park, that house to somewhere else, some other park, but yeah. it costs five to seven grand to move that house, right? Yep. Yeah. So owning the trailers itself is not a good idea. And why not? Because we want them, first of all, our whole mission 
to be frank, is to give oppor- the opportunity to the people that were renting the American dream and, and to own that house, right? So they're yeah. establishing better credit. They're getting the tax benefit. They own that asset, but they also fix all the problems. So if the roof leaks yeah. or whatever that, you know, so we just want to own the land. We want to own the infrastructure. We want to, um, you know, we, we're tied to city water and sewer, right? So we all end right. up being basically the homeowners association. All right. So I'm wrapping my my head around this deal. So um, 21 were either not paying. You took five to the dump. 19 were paying yep. or, or vacant. Then when you rented out, then those people moved their trailers to the lot. 21 lots were available to rent for someone to put a home there. And of the other, were you doing rent to own for the ones that the park owned at the time or? So there was 40 total homes. And what's interesting about the park, yeah. there's room for 80, right? So there's a huge yeah. upside. Just last week, I just ordered the first five, uh, seven, actually seven homes to be infilled, right? So this is all before we infilled anything. What so do you mean by infilled? Infilled. So, mean, so yeah, so so let's, let's just round out. So there's 40 homes there, right? Right yeah. now, there was yeah. empty lots, which, which was really interesting because I didn't know what I didn't know, but those empty lots, because there's seasonal workers and there's manufacturing jobs. So we actually turned those to RV parking to, during the summer. So we had all of this, these RVs for two, three, four months, paying us a ton of money, like two, three times what they would for long-term rent. So we got we uh-huh. got that revenue in. We got more revenue from the laundry mat. We're bringing in the storage facilities. So we basically just put in the temporary pads to the RV parking to get ready for where we're at right now. Because when we're infilling, we can go back and buy brand new homes for, say, $55,000 and then ship those in. And then, we'll, again, we'll sell those off. So there's, it's layer on layer on layer on top of, of revenue, right? You got the original ones. We sold off the... Yeah park owned homes to, to the tenants. They own it. We have the storage unit. We have the laundry facility. We have the so, RV right, so let's, go, let's go back to question one. So you sold them to the tenants on a rent to own basis or to, yes. so they could reestablish their credit Correct. and take title. Yep. And the Warren Buffett and has then, a company that will handle that financing called 21st century mortgage. So if they have okay. horrible credit, if they have yep. 400 plus, they can go to 21st percent mm-hmm. mortgage, 21st century mortgage and get financing through Warren Buffett's company at like mm-hmm. eight, nine, 10, 12 percent interest. So we he don't have to carry that paper. Anymore. Yeah, he owns yep. he's the second largest. He's he owns the second most after Sam Zell. But he also owns the most he finances everything. And he's been in yep. for 15 years now. So first revenue is is the rent to own for the existing and and uh, renting the existing pads. Second revenue stream is the um, the laundromat. And you said that you increased the revenues of the laundromat. How'd you do that? I think it was the automation, right? I mean, we were just taking the, you know, they were taking cash and or, or coins and just making it really easy. The signage, you know, not to just people in our park, are in, but the, we made it really nice. It's already nice, but we made it nicer. Um, so people yeah. outside of the park are going to our laundry bath oh. and spending their money. Did you put any new machines or the machines were already nice? and Already there. It was already a good area. Oh, yep. everything was in good condition. But it's, 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 it's cl- it'll be over on her grand. Friendly. I'll tell you that uh, I'd never heard of that app where they go in and, um, you know, they can uh, put the, you know, read the cell card phone. and then, yeah, read the cell phone and then get, get called when your laundry's done. That's, that's definitely a big benefit. All right. So you increase the revenues there. You said you, what, is it 70 now? And then you increase it? We're right, still only at 40. Or? So all of that was when we bought it. Like we, we got, when we went back to the bank seven months later and got appraised again, mm-hmm. bought it a million five, appraised at 2.7. That's just with the yep. first phase of making it prettier and landscaping and cleaning it up and taking off the bad ones. That's it. That's not counting okay, but I was the about, storage. Wait a minute. I was talking about the, the laundry revenue. So the laundry mm-hmm. revenue, when you took it over, was how much? And then what did you 70, what, what'd you increase? 70,000. Oh, 70 to We're probably at like uh, 90,000 already in year two. Okay, nice. All right. So then the next, or so have you put in the storage facilities yet? Just bringing those in right now. All right. So now you have another cash flow item, the storage facilities. You have 40 additional lots that you're renting out to RVs, but the storage facilities, you even have space for that as well on this lot. How many acres is this? So we bought, it's about, um, there's, I think, 13 or 14 acres, but just last month, we bought oh, wow. two more. We just bought two more parks last month. And what's cool is that we yeah. bought the park adjacent. It literally shares a fence. So it took us from like seven acres to like, I don't know, like 14 acres, something like that. And that gave you a bunch of additional land for storage? 
Well, it gave us more, uh, you know, give us another 30 ish houses as well. Yep. Investors like to be over that magic hundred, right? So, and, and I didn't tell you, Dave, but I started a fund um, 120 days ago. So we went through and, and launched a fund. So we went through the SEC, mm-hmm. it took us six months, and we raised, we had one Zoom call, we raised about $2.3 million on, on that one call. So what's, what's the name of your fund and how can people, if they're interested, contact you on that fund? Yep. So my website, the easiest way to go to it is makemailbox.money. So make mailbox money. And the fund is, nice. is Mobile Home Park Fund One is the name of it. Oh, nice. All right. So then the next uh, revenue stream is now you got these additional 40 lots and you rent them to RVs for one season. And the next season, you're actually buying units and putting them on there. And then you're going to do rent to own for those? Correct. So if you're buying it for 55, when they're done with the rent to own, how much are you getting for that, for that particular unit? Well, they can, again, they can get the, they can get the whole financing from the, from Warren Buffett. So he handles all oh, that. We don't have to deal with it. You know, that's, that's their paper. Yeah. That's his paper. That's his interest. And, and we're helping reestablish credit, right. For those people that may have had, a, you know, gone through a divorce or, you know, have a, you know, they want to own. And they can actually own for less than they were renting. So that's perfect. Now, what's happened, there was a challenge is in the last 120 days, the cost for homes have gone from like 45000 to 60000 I mean, the lumber, steel, everything's super expensive. Shortage. Shortage. Yeah. So we're, I'm flying to Texas in two weeks to meet with a gentleman that has um, lumber and a sawmill and 40,000 RV pads. And he's making tiny homes for under 25,000, uh, a tiny home. So I'm really interested in meeting, wow. bringing those in and shipping little cute tiny homes to the, you know, make them to our mobile home parks because we now, you know, we have five parks in the last year or so. That's awesome. There's such a shortage of uh, raw supplies that I went, I just recently bought a shed, an 18 by 10 shed from my backyard for landscaping stuff. And um, so I decided uh, to make a change and I wanted to change over to natural cedar shingles. That shed cost me, I think it was $7,200. They said if I wanted to, the cedar shingles, it was going to be an additional $5,500. I was like, the shed only costs, you know, 72 or 70 something. And they said, yeah, but that, there's a shortage of shingles. You can't get them. That's what it's going to cost you. I was like, that's crazy. I'm building so a 1,800 say, square foot garage. My daughter, I told you, my daughter just bought her first, first house and last year. We're building a big garage on because she has an acre. And just yep. the materials is going up 30%. Like bids I got three months ago. You know, so something that was like, you know, 10,000 is now, you know, 13, 14,000. It's crazy. Mm-hmm. So again, that's why I'm again, pivoting, trying to get ahead of that. Smart. All right. So what was the biggest challenge in this deal? I, from my perspective, because I was a limited partner, I didn't have any, I wrote a check and you know, when the yeah. checks came to my mailbox, it was literally mailbox money. Right. Um, yeah. But Rudy, Rudy said, I asked him that yesterday and he, his, it was a reputation. He said that, you know, in this little small town, the challenge, biggest challenge was when you have a bad reputation, you know, you can go in and, and do make it pretty and, they did all sorts of incentives for, you know, um, like the house of the month and giving them a $250, you know, gift card. And, but just, it's changing that reputation. Right? Changing the perception. Right. Yeah. Because it, basically what you did is you t- you did a repositioning in a mobile home park, mm-hmm. right? You took it over and it was, it was 50% uh, vacant and you had a bad reputation and, you know, five of them, five of the uh, units needed to be hauled out of there and the place looked like crap and deferred maintenance and, Right. And before you can, you know, and you, you, the first thing you do is you do the exterior stuff first. So people can start driving by and saying, Hey, that place has changed, you know, and then you change the signage. And then the biggest hurdle is changing the perception in the community. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the only real way that you know that you've changed the perception in the community is when somebody that moves in actually refers it to somebody else and you get a, you know, you get a referral tenant. That's the first sign that you're actually starting. And it takes a while, it t- you know, it takes up to a year you know, to change the perception because, you know, everybody just, everybody knows what that place is like or was like and expects it to be the same. The so, second uh, thing he said, mentioned is, is the manager that she was actually managing the park before, but she was handcuffed. Like she had no authority. She was frustrated because she had, she had to run through the, you know, everything with the old owners. They wouldn't spend any money. I mean, we're, we're you know, we're, mm. we're from California. We have fresh cash and we're happy to mm-hmm. pour money in to make it cleaner, safer and, and better. And we've also she been ecstatic. She, she's ecstatic, but she'll, she's, I mean, you know, to quote Rudy, she, you know, she'll walk on coals to, for us now. Right. Cause she, she's being enabling her to 
to take care of the park. She's managing three of our parks now and just a freaking rock star, wow. right? So, so Probably I think that's it. the secret sauce too, is, you know, not getting in the way of your, your managers and giving them. After, after you get the confidence in them. Yes, absolutely. Right. I agree. You know, one of the things, you know, when we, when we teach um, on hiring a management company, and, you know, we say, go around and, look, you know, find, find out what their sign looks like and then drive around different neighborhoods and look for the same sign and see how the, you know, the property managed, see what it looks like on the outside. But in some cases, you have owners that will not pay for certain things to be done on a property and it frustrates the management company. But then there's two sides to that. You know, mm-hmm. the management company gets frustrated and they can't do what they want to do on a property and they stay with the owner. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? You know what I mean? It's not one of the criteria we use now. It's just like kind of like a heads up when we're looking for management companies because of that, because of uh, the ownership issues. All right. So what were your biggest fears going into this deal as a passive or as the, as the last guy in? Yeah. I, you know, it's a new team. You know, I, you, I've invested in four or five of, you know, the people that you introduced me at dinner, you know, Mike Flatter, Flattery and Bikram and all those guys. Oh, Mike right? invested so, in this deal? No, no I, I've invested the other way. Right. So I, oh. I wrote checks to those guys to some of your top people to test how they communicate with investors, how they, so, so it was just a new group. Right. So I guess I think, you know, any investor, my biggest fear was you can be very educated and have good track record. But I just, you know, I, I'm very selective and protective of my investors on, you know, these are my closest Mm -hmm. friends. Right. So like I said, that's why I took my top two. That's, you know, that's biggest fear. Biggest fear. It's one thing I lose my own money, but losing my friend's money is not okay. So, oh, absolutely. So what, um, what's the biggest lesson from this particular deal? What would you, what would you share with somebody that was going to get into a similar type of a deal, a mobile home park? I think the biggest lesson I, I got it right was don't do it yourself. It, it is very complex in finding the deals, underwriting the deals, understanding how to source the inflow, um, working with the property management. It's not, and I mentioned Rudy, but there's, you know, there's, you know, Mike and Alan, two guys behind Rudy. There's a full team that has five to seven years experience on doing this. Right. So I'm smart enough and just not to try to crack this one by myself. Like I did all, all the multifamily, right. Cause I, I kind of bridged from what I bought back in 08 and 09 and it was all my own money. So I went fast and hard. I figured that out. And that's, that's an easy leap to do the multifamily on your own. Um, yeah. I would not even, try to do one of these <laughs> that makes sense without a team without a team. Yeah, without it's a just team, like a big right. repositioning you know mm-hmm. you want to when you do multifamily, you want to start with momentum play right and then go you know and then do a repositioning but when you're jumping into mobile home mobile home new construction anything like that have your team in place for the first couple you know one or two have them teach you how to do it just like you know you were smart you went to dinner with, dinner with us before mm-hmm. uh, ultimate partnering uh, 19 here in boston you met some really yep. top guys you got on their list you invested with them and you learned how they did it Yep. You know, that's the, that's the way you learn. That's all and, good. All right. And the, Are you the ready? Big, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just saying the big difference I want to get this in is that, you know, on the more, the problem with the, the apartments and it's again, still great. It's going the right direction. I love my, my apartments, but the, the when you're remotely managing through a profit, property management company and you have that churn every 18 months and you're paying them to do the make ready. And I feel like I'm on a roller coaster. What I like about the mobile home park is that those tenants that own that house will be there three years, 13 years, 30 years. I mean, it's a really long customer point. base and they just don't, you don't have this turn. This is killing me on my apartments. You know, it's like my expense ratio is way, way lower because you have this long-term tenant taking care of the property. That's the key difference. I just want to make sure I got and, that in. And I, I'm not sure if you said it p- before we actually started recording or after, but you had mentioned that in order for a tenant to move, it's going to cost them five to seven thousand dollars to move. Correct. Back. And we own five of the other parks out of a total of ten in the whole town, and we'll buy the other five. Wow. And those uh, the other owner, one guy owns the other four. I mean, he's we're already under yeah. contract. Yeah, I mean, he, he, we're going to get the other ones. We'll own the entire town with thousand pads. So where are they going to move it to? Wow. I mean, they can move it to any right. of our other parks. They just don't do that. So, and and you know, we we really we'll work with them if they get behind. We can work with them. You know, that's exciting. It's an exciting new business you got yourself into. It's fun. Yeah. Now you're the mayor of that town. Right. <laughs> That's awesome. All right. You ready to play lightning round? Sure. All right. So we're going to play lightning round. For those of you that are new to this, I'm going to ask Jason a bunch of different questions. He's going to give the first answer that pops off the top of his head. This is all meant to be in fun. So the first question is, Jason, would you rather text or talk to somebody? Text. Absolutely. All right. What's your favorite day of the week? Sunday. And why Sunday? It's uh, just my time to kind of slow down and process what happened last week and plan for the, for Monday. 
Awesome. Reset. Uh, what's your favorite city in the U.S. besides the one that you live in? I like Vegas. I don't know why, but it's a fun town. Nice. What's the nickname that your parents used to call you or maybe still do? Uh, Jace. What's the last song you downloaded? I listened to Kid Rock. All right. And would you rather speak every language in the world or be able to talk to animals? Every language in the world. What's your favorite holiday? Thanksgiving. On a scale of one to 10, how good a driver are you? Nine. Fill in the blank. Taylor Swift is? Smart. At what age do you want to retire? I will retire at 55 in three years. Would you rather be invisible or have super strength? Invisible. <laughs> That'd be fun. All right. And the, and the last question is, is it wrong for a vegetarian to eat animal crackers? Uh, animal crackers? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That has been another edition of Deal Lab. Folks, if you like this, press the like button. You can also hit the subscribe button so you don't, uh, so you don't miss it. And also, we do this live every Monday at 2 o'clock on Facebook. So you can join us there as well. So, uh, Jason, very, thank you very much for, for coming on and sharing your story. Be catching up with you. All right. And we'll talk to everybody else soon. You've been listening to the Multifamily Deal Lab Podcast, where the deals get done. If you'd like to learn more, visit davetoday.com. And don't forget to leave a five-star rating and review and hit that subscribe button so you don't miss an episode. Thanks for listening.